Namaste, and welcome to the Buddhism Guide podcast by Yeshi Rabge. If you'd like more of my podcasts, blogs, videos, or guided meditation practices, visit my website, yeshirabge.com. And if you'd like to support my work, go to patreon.com forward slash Buddhism Guide. I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is called The Mangala Sutra, Part 4. In Part 4 of the Mangala Sutra, we continue to look at the social principles. This covers how we can refrain from harmful acts and how we need to put great effort into developing beneficial acts and avoiding destructive ones. Refrain from harmful acts. If we don't want to disturb our minds, we have to be sure we go through life not harming others. Once we start harming them, we release a Pandora's box of emotions and feelings within ourselves. So harmful acts are not good for us or others. Nobody wins. So how do we know what constitutes harmful acts? Buddha mentioned 10 harmful acts to steer clear of. They're divided into three aspects, three for bodily actions, four for speech, and three for mind. These ten harmful acts cover what we think, say, and do. The opposite to the ten harmful acts are the ten helpful acts. I'll mention the helpful acts at the end of each harmful act. Let's look at the three parts individually. The ways we harm others with our bodily actions are through killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. All of these have been covered in the previous podcasts on the Mangala Sutra. However, the helpful aspect of these three are, instead of killing, have compassion and empathy for all living things. Instead of stealing, be generous and charitable. Instead of sexual misconduct, have self-control and follow a code of ethics. The four harmful acts of speech are lying, divisive speech, harsh words, and idle talk, and have also been previously covered. I would encourage you to look back to remind yourself. The positive side to these four are, instead of lying, speak only the truth. Instead of being divisive, speak kind words that bring people together. Instead of using harsh words, use pleasing and kind words. And instead of wasting your time on idle talk, speak only meaningful and encouraging words. Now let's turn to the three unhelpful acts of the mind. Buddha stated this about these three kinds of mental conduct. And how are there three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with harmless conduct? Here, someone is covetous, or he has a mind of resentment, or he has an unwise view, distorted vision. That is how there are three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with harmless conduct. Covetness. This is born out of greed and desire. It's when we want what someone else has. Instead of being happy that someone has something new, we selfishly want it for ourselves. It may be a material thing we desire. It may be wealth or even another person. This way of thinking brings us only dissatisfaction. We may be able to outwardly pretend we are happy for 
what others have. But inwardly, we're burning with covetousness and negative thoughts. Resentment. This is to have angry and hateful thoughts towards someone. Though it's also possible to have bitterness towards a situation or even ourselves. It can make you burn inside and you're unable to concentrate on anything else but your loathing is usually driven by resentment, jealousy, pride or anger. This is extremely powerful and the reason we have resentment is because we see other people as different than us, as outside of us. We don't see the interconnectedness of life. If you think about what you want and what you don't want out of life, you'll see you're striving to be happy and try not to suffer. You're not alone. Everyone is exactly the same, even animals. So, if we see that others are no different than ourselves, we'll build compassion towards them, or at the very least, we'll be empathic towards them. This is how we can stop any resentment we may feel. Unwise view. The unwise view we are talking about here is a view whereby you believe that acts do not have consequences. You think it doesn't matter what you do because nothing is going to come of it. You have no regard for cause and effect or interconnectedness. You also believe that things are permanent and true happiness can be found in material things, even though everything around you points to the opposite of this. You feel there is a solid permanent self. This point will be discussed in more detail in another part of this series. You don't believe you are suffering and so are not interested in following a path that may lead to a reduction in that suffering. All of these constitute an unwise view that are going to lead you down the wrong path in life. The helpful side of these three are, instead of coveting what others have, be satisfied and contented. Instead of having resentment, have goodwill by thinking kind and helpful thoughts, as these will lead to good and helpful actions. Instead of having an unwise view, study Buddha's foundation teachings, clear up any doubts, meditate on what you've learned, and then implement them, as this will lead you to having a wise view. Part two of this is about achieving great effort. In the last section, we looked at what 10 harmful acts we had to refrain from and what their counterparts were. Now, we'll look at the effort we have to put in to avoid in harmful acts and developing helpful ones. The helpful actions are compassion, generosity, self-control, truthfulness, kind words, pleasant and helpful words, contentment, benevolence and wise view. Buddha spoke about four great efforts, the effort to avoid, the effort to overcome, the effort to develop and the effort to maintain. So let's look at these four. The effort to avoid. The first effort is to prevent harmful actions and emotions that have not yet arisen. These harmful potential actions disturb our minds and the minds of others around us. So we must make the effort to avoid arousing them. A big obstacle that hinders our effort and concentration and so makes it difficult to stop the arousal of harmful states are the five hindrances, which are sensual desire, resentfulness, apathy, anxiety 
and down. So let's just have a quick look at these hindrances. Sensual desire is straightforward. They are desires of the senses. This hindrance is activated when our senses come into contact with sense objects, such as eye to form, ear to sound, nose to smell, tongue to taste, body to tangibles and mind to thoughts. Every time we point our concentration at our practice, this hindrance may pop up and distract us. We get stupefied by these sense objects and we start to crave them and feel attachment towards them. Resentfulness. This has just been covered above. Apathy. Apathy makes our minds numb, so it's virtually impossible for us to concentrate or difficult for us to arouse any interest. It can make us lethargic and sleepy. All of these make it very hard for us to do any practice. Anxiousness is when we're feeling tense and irritable. It could be that we're stressed from work. We may have money problems, be worried about the future, or our mind is just overloaded. This hindrance makes us overexcited and emotionally troubled. We're not able to concentrate on anything for any length of time. This is because we're not in the present moment. Our thoughts are either in the past or the future. Doubt is when we have a lack of confidence. It could be we don't understand what we should be doing, or we don't trust that it works, or we think we're not doing it correctly. All of these makes us wonder if what we're doing is benefiting us. So what is the connection between harmful actions, emotions that have not yet arisen, and hindrances? Usually, hindrances are activated when your senses come into contact with sense objects, such as eye to form and ear to sound and so on. The mind deals with these impressions in different ways, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and sometimes even neutral. When it deals with them in a positive or neutral way, there's no problem regarding harmful thoughts, feelings and emotions. Although positive impressions may lead to overexcitement. However, when it deals with them in a negative way, these sense objects stir up harmful thoughts, feelings and emotions. We have to become aware of the hindrances that are stopping us from arousing helpful states. Once we've done that, we can implement the antidotes to these hindrances. These will stop the five hindrances in their track and in turn prevent any harmful thoughts and emotions from arising. The effort to overcome. The first effort stopped harmful actions and emotions from arising. Whereas this effort is to overcome the harmful states that have already arisen. Buddha says that we should abandon the harmful states, dispel them, destroy them, and cause them to disappear. But how? He gave five techniques to help us do this. And they are, one, chase away the harmful thought with a helpful one. If you have been in the grip of harmful thoughts and emotions during the day, try using one of these reflections. A. Sensual desires can be overcome by reflecting on the impermanence of things. B. Resentfulness can be overcome by reflecting that all beings want happiness and to reduce their suffering. C. Lack of interest or laziness can be overcome by stopping what you're doing, be it studying or reflecting, and go for a walk or splash water on your face, 
Do simple stretching exercises, or my favorite, simply have a cup of tea. D, anxiousness. Anxiousness can be overcome through a mindful breathing meditation. This will help you become more relaxed and focused. And finally, E, doubt can be overcome by simply asking questions and investigating. So, it's extremely important to chase away unhelpful thoughts and emotions. Two, regret. We're not talking about guilt here. That is quite a different thing. Regret does not mean beating yourself up over something you've done. Here we must reflect on our harmful actions and build up a kind of aversion that will stop us from doing these actions again. It's not enough to just commit ourselves to stopping these actions. We have to make an effort not to do them again. It's a bit ridiculous to feel remorse for our harmful actions and then do exactly the same thing again. Our effort must be focused on never repeating these harmful actions. Three, divert your attention. When a harmful thought arises, don't indulge it. If you're walking down the street and you see the latest smartphone, or a person you're angry with, or the car of your dreams, or some other sense object you're craving, you should simply turn away. Look in the other direction, or think about something else, as this will avert any unhelpful thoughts and emotions that may arise. Of course, this is easier said than done. 4. Confrontation This technique is the opposite of the third one. Confront the harmful thoughts head on. Don't shy away from it. Look at it and see where it came from. By doing this, the thought will eventually disappear. This confrontation may be difficult to do at the time, so it can be done during your meditation session. Once you get more experience, you can confront the harmful thought as it arises. 5. Suppression A note of caution here. In my experience, when you suppress things, you're just storing up trouble for the future. If you suppress a bad experience or a powerful emotion, it may resurface much stronger later on. This technique is my least favourite and must be used only as the last resort, but I hope the other four techniques would have worked already by then. These are the five techniques Buddha mentioned to overcome our harmful thoughts and emotions that have already arisen. The effort to develop. The third effort is to develop helpful qualities that have not yet arisen. This is where you should make an effort to develop thoughts and actions such as generosity and compassion, patience, an ethical code and empathy. Again, the perfect time to think about and cultivate these helpful states is during your meditation session. If you review each day which thoughts and actions have been helpful and which have been harmful, you'll see a pattern emerge. You'll be able to see what you need to work on and make into a kind of a habit. Remember that we're trying to live a responsible life that disturbs neither our mind nor the minds of others. What is really needed here is honesty. We must be completely truthful with ourselves and investigate which helpful states we don't have and then put all of our effort into cultivating them. This is how we can develop helpful states that have not yet arisen. The effort to maintain. The fourth and final effort is to maintain the helpful states that have already arisen. This follows on from the previous effort. There, 
you contemplated which helpful states you didn't have. Now, you must focus on the ones you do have. You should remain mindful at all times of these helpful states, so they can become a habit. It's no good lying sometimes and telling the truth at others, stealing sometimes and not stealing other times, getting totally drunk one day and saying you don't drink another day, or being faithful sometimes and cheating on your partner at other times. These helpful states must become natural and spontaneous. You have to put a great amount of effort into keeping these helpful states going, because if you don't stay aware, they can easily drift away from you. Awareness is the key here. Be happy that you have these helpful states and give yourself a pat on the back. I mean it. Because it shows that you're on the right path to living responsibly, which in turn should help increase your self-confidence and happiness. Let us summarise the main points here. We have to avoid harmful states that have not yet arisen. Overcome the harmful states that have arisen. Develop helpful states that have not yet arisen and maintain the harmful states that have arisen. This is where we should be concentrating our effort, so we start to alleviate our suffering and the suffering of others. This podcast is based on my book, Life's Meandering Path, and is available from Amazon and Kindle. This is the end of this episode, but if you'd like to listen to more of my podcasts, go to my website, yeshirabge.com. So thank you so much for listening. And remember, the only person we can ever really know is ourselves. Bye for now.